I'm Gabriela Fresquez for Radar 2021. It's official. Latinx is account for over half of America's population growth. Like reggaeton in South Florida, we're everywhere. And usually too loud. According to U.S. Census data, there are just over 62 million of us in the U.S. And nearly every American lives in a county with an increasing number of Latinxes, which is basically neo-Nazi and man with the most punchable face in America, Richard Spencer's worst nightmare, realized. For the first time, all population growth has been driven by minorities. The overall uh, ethnic and racial makeup of America, what has increased Hispanic uh, Americans, Asian Americans, what has decreased for the first time, the white non-Hispanic population under 60%. Was it a challenge to count every American amid numerous natural disasters, a global pandemic, and a prominent reality TV star attempting to add a citizenship question to the census? Unquestionably. But the roadblocks threatening to thwart the count of U.S. Latino populations were, for the most part, avoided. Census numbers matter because population data determines how the feds allocate billions of dollars for programs that our communities rely on. But is a Latinx takeover officially underway? That sort of depends where you live. In my home state of California, East LA reported an undercount of Latinxes, with experts attributing it to everything from the pandemic to gentrification. Rising rents in Boyle Heights has both residents and activists concerned about gentrification forcing some longtime neighbors out. Boyle Heights has become attractive to developers because of its proximity to downtown LA's arts district. Double digit increases in both rent and home prices, but many residents say they cannot afford it. It's not fair to us, you know, to people like me that we're low income. This census hiccup might have long term consequences since these numbers also help define how voting lines are redistricted ultimately determining who has political power and who represents us. From city council members to school board members to county commissioners, all the way up to DC. But while East LA appears to be losing its Latinos, the silver lining could be that Latinxes are now the largest population group in California. California is a state that has the largest Hispanic population with over 15 million Latinos. But sometime around the middle of the decade, the number of people who are of Latino heritage living there surpass the number of white non-Hispanics living there. And this makes California only the second state where Latinos are the largest uh, a single racial or ethnic group, the only other state being New Mexico. What's striking here is that the Latino population has been growing faster because of births in California to Hispanic parents, uh, but also because the state of California has seen an outmigration of many white non-Hispanics to other states in the West, like Idaho or Oregon or Washington state. Other states are also reporting a significant uptick and not necessarily the ones you'd think. I was originally born in Honduras, my parents decided to bring me to the United States at the age of 12. At first, I arrived in New York, but then we were called to come and work here in Big Sky, Montana, where I um, recently reside. I did an internship with my local newspaper where I reported about the skills, um, obstacles, needs, and fears um, that surround the Latino community and effective ways to attack those issues. Um, the one thing I learned is that the number one um, issue that we face is the lack of information that is available to us in Spanish. So I decided to start Noticias Montaña. We have a website and we have a Facebook page. I'm definitely not surprised that people don't think that there are many Latinos in Montana because um, there, it's true, there isn't much diversity here over the years. A lot of the Latino population from around the country and from um, Latin American countries as well have been arriving here because there's a demand for um, jobs. There are some Latino places and like Mexican restaurants and there's also a Latino store where you can go and buy some of those treats that keep us going every day. In regards to my home, we always make paleadas on Fridays and so I'm always close to my Honduran heritage because of how close we keep our culture in our family. 
Some notable stories are really in the Dakotas. Um, in North Dakota and South Dakota, those are the two states that had the fastest growing Hispanic populations as people were attracted to part of the country, Latinos and non-Latinos alike. So it's really quite a diverse story about who those Latinos are who are moving there and what it is that they do for work in that part of the country. I'm Veronica Calles Torres. I am from Bolivia, the, from a small town called Coroico. Currently, I'm living in North Dakota, Fargo, and I work at North Dakota State University as a postdoctoral research scientist. I wanted to be a scientist and working with insect pests on crops. I grew up in a small farm. Uh, my dad uh, used to cultivate coffee, citrus like mandarins, oranges. That's why I, uh, I was interested in the production and also entomology because there are many insect pests. I study corn root worms. The larvae feed on the roots of the corn plant. And the other insect that I study is European corn borer. It's a moth. It's also pests in corn. Corn for me means a lot of things. In Bolivia, there are different types of corn. Sometimes even if I say like I'm from Bolivia, sometimes some people won't identify my country very easily in the map. I show like, for example, my culture and they can learn a little bit from my culture from Bolivia. Latinx populations are also booming beyond the big metro areas like in Long Island, where we make up more than 20% of its almost 3 million citizens. It's also where a thriving Salvadoran community, that's had a lengthy streak of bad press, has been pushing back on the uh, bad hombres narrative. I am 100% Salvadorian, born and raised in the resilient and magical state of New York. I was a official state finalist in the 2021 Miss New York USA pageant. Melissa Bonilla. It was a dream come true to represent the Salvadorian women. That was my goal, to represent our culture. We're definitely a big community here in Long Island, and I am very involved with my community, especially with the Latino Leadership Council of Patchogue. From Bravo Supermarket, Melissa Bonilla. I am currently operating and managing my family business, which is Bravo Supermarket. We carry, you know, all Latin products that, you know, you would probably find in your home country in Colombia, El Salvador, Ecuador. We've been there for over 20 years now. We are business owners here in Long Island. The first generation kids are taking things to the next level for us as well and accomplishing many great things. And I'm so proud of every single Salvadorian that has you know, left a, a positive impact in this community. Positos is a nonprofit organization based in New York, specifically Long Island, that strives to give back to kids in El Salvador, um, specifically in La Paz, the Department of La Paz. And in there, we are able to help kids with extracurricular activities such as soccer, um, both um, young boys, young women, and anywhere in between. And we are also working on scholarship programs for kids in high school and college to further their education. So a few years ago, when I went to go visit El Salvador, I was with my uncle. And at the time he was a volunteer coach for the Canton, the village. And they had just changed the mayor and they defunded the soccer program they had there. And we decided to make this a nonprofit to be able to help continue sports in the Canton, um, just to keep kids off the streets and doing something positive something that's physically well for them and that they love. I grew up with like 90% of us being Salvadorians, right? There's a lot of professionals and young professionals that are up and coming here in Long Island, giving back to our communities or people who need help. A state where minorities have steadily become the majority is Texas. Oh, the Lone Star State, known for its barbecue, guns, and for making every gal's dystopian dreams come true. At least those Houston handmaids won't be forced to wear masks. Under Governor Abbott's eye, the Latinx population is now nearly as large as the non-Latinx white population. Even the one small German town of New Braunfels is now 35% Latinx. And as Latinx populations boom, so does the diversity within them. What's up, mi gente? My name is Sergio Palacios. You may know me as the taco tourist. And today I'm heading over to Houston, Texas because we all know Texas has a large population of Latinx people, right? Most of them Mexican-American. But a new census report 
says that actually Venezuelans are starting to grow in what we call Catyzuela or Katy, a suburb of Houston. So we're gonna go meet up with our friend Chef Omar to find out exactly what's causing that boom. Omar, thank Serio. you so much for having us, man. So Dude, where are we at today? Coming. We're near Catyzuela, sir. This place is home. Okay. Uh, it's Tuto Pane. We know all these folks are awesome, okay. and uh, we're gonna pick up some stuff. Would you like a frescolita over I here? I would love a frescolita. There you go. All right, man. Cheers. Salud, Baba. Tell me about this Venezuelan boom in Katy. What, what's going on here? We love Texas, and, and Katy is just uniquely located near to the energy corridor, which, you know, that's what brought a lot of people from the oil and gas industry in the early 2000s, yeah. and now we're just everywhere. So now we see a lot of Venezuelans in food and beverage industry as well. How have the Texans received you? Dude, it's awesome. People just make you feel special, make you feel welcome. People here are trying to roll their R's and trying to say Omar rather than Omar, you know? <laughs> How have you seen sort of the evolution of having more and more Venezuelans in the Katy Houston area? There's just an overwhelming amount of Venezuelans. In restaurants especially, you see them a lot. This right here, they didn't even have this in Houston a oh, few yeah. years ago. We were serious cornmeal smugglers back in the day and now we can find this at every grocery store. We have a huge culture for cheese. We love cheese that's made out of milk that's not pasteurized. So it took years for us to be able to get queso de mano. Let's do it, man. We got the booties. Yeah, let's go. After checking out Tuto Pane in Querizuela, Omar took us to downtown Houston to visit a restaurant owned by two Venezuelans and a Filipino Mexican chef. Like, look at this stuff. It, it has our culture in it. Well, it has some Venezuelan, it has some Mexican, some Filipino, international cuisine, but it's just done right. That's why I wanted to bring you to Mastrantos. Venezuela is one of the countries that consume most pasta in Whoa. the world. Like one in the top five with Argentina and of course Italy. We consume over 13 kilograms a year per person. That's crazy. Why do you think it drives some of that? Well, because we had a lot of immigration. So we okay. had a lot of Lebanese, Portuguese, Italian. We've been talking about that while we've been eating is all the different various influences uh, from different cuisines around the world. I mean, mm -hmm. we just had uh, chorizo with pasta, like cachapa with barbacoa. So, like, can you tell us a little bit about that and like how you guys got that creative? Houston is a big melting pot of different cultures, different cuisines, and obviously Venezuela is coming in into that mixture. And the owners, Xavier Amati and myself, come from different backgrounds. And what we want to do is we want to highlight all those different cultures, but also all the cultures of Houston and kind of blend people's tradition and their techniques into just one place. Oh. In the last two decades, the number of immigrants arriving from Latin America has declined sharply, while at the same time, the number of children Hispanic parents are having has been growing. As a result, it is births to Hispanic parents that have mattered more in the last two decades in driving Hispanic population growth. You see things going on in California and New York. A lot of people from those states actually migrate here to Atlanta or to Georgia to get away from all the busyness from the big cities. Even though we are all underneath uh, the term Latino, the children now, two generations, three generations later, are getting back to more so the ancestral identity. As uh, American Latinos, it is proud to have both identities as both American and as Latinos in your, uh, in your culture. I would prefer to, to just consider myself Chicano. The term Chicano got really popular in the 60s during the Chicano movement in, in the West Coast. And it was just a, a form of self-identity within ourselves. Terms like Hispanic and Latino came from European settlers and it, it glorifies our oppressors. So I just choose to, to use um, Chicano. For me, why I got civically engaged is mostly because I was inspired by the Chicano movement. Just knowing that we're um, taking that baton and going forward with it just really inspires me. Hey, OP, let's get rid of that toxic masculinity one time. Some of the misconceptions for sure is that, you know, we're all gang members or we're all trying to um, cause trouble. We're luchadores, you know, we're, we're really try to help out, one, our people, ourselves, our family, just the community, you know. <laughs> we do a good job in everything that we do so, so we can have a, a, a good light on us. And unfortunately, something that's really big in, in the Latino community is, is, is racism and even the, the color skin that we have. You know, a lot of times we make jokes about even dark skinned Latinos, Afro-Latinos. Afro I feel like our generation is very open-minded compared to our, uh, the previous generations of our, of our parents. Everyone that you look up to, is, it is, is a human being. 
and also is very flawed. So always take everyone with a grain of salt. You never know what someone's going through behind closed doors. Look up to your mother, look up to your parents, look up to people in the community that you see doing, doing their thing every day, the janitor. People that you really feel are trying to do good for the community. Probably one of the biggest census findings is that the number of people in the U.S. who identify as multiracial has nearly tripled. But is this solely the result of a diverse population growth, or could it also have something to do with how people self-identify? Or the fact that many Latinx people don't identify as white, black, or Asian, or consider Latinidad to be its own distinct racial category? For Latinxes, filling out a census form can get muy complicado. These results from the census also show some very interesting findings about the ways in which Latinos see their own racial identity. In 2020, about 20% 20 of Latinos said that their race was white, but that's down from 53% who said the same back in 2010. The big story is the increase in the number of Latinos who say that they are multiracial. That number is at about 20 million people now and makes up about a third of the Latino population, but that's way up from 2010 when only about 6 million Latinos said the same. What if the increase in multiracial identifying people has something to do with America's obsession with genealogy, a now multi-billion dollar industry? Millions of Americans have taken a DNA test. Turns out we're 100% that determined to prove our ethnicness. <gasps> I got the DNA results back. I'm 0.2% Southern East African? Mommy, mommy, do you know that I got on the DNA test that I'm part Southern East African? Do we have any primos there? No, you don't know? I'm gonna check on Facebook. Okay, bye. Whoa, that's so interesting. This region has bred some of the most well-known scientists. No wonder I got straight A's in science. <laughs> Yo, do you know that I'm part Southern East African? Yep, yep, I took the DNA test. Have you taken yours? We should compare and see if we share some things. Who knows, maybe we're related. <laughs> Wait, I got a really cool playlist I wanna show you. It's the hot hits from South Africa. All right, so I can arrive to the East London Airport in South Africa and go from there. Wow, these are pricey. But whatever I gotta do to connect with my roots. Let me check the tours. Hey, what's for dinner? Oh, you know, just making baboti. It's my first time, but I'm letting my South African gods take control. So yeah, I booked my trip. I leave next month. I'm super excited to connect with... Wait, 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 wait. That envelope says my name. What do you mean? <laughs> oh my God, you've been reading my results all this time. No way. Guess I'm the one who's 0-2% Southern East African. Thanks for the research. <sighs> Whatever your specific descent or lineage, Latinx is always bring a sense of community wherever we put down roots. Whether it's the local panaderia, the beauty salon, la iglesia, the barbershop, these places can quickly morph into the local spot where you can get all the latest chisme, as well as play a critical role in helping to keep the community safe. We grew up in the, in the countryside in Dominican Republic, which is mm -hmm. like everybody, and we have a middle class life, good time. I came to New Hampshire because when you're young, you got more with your mother go and your father. They came to New Hampshire to work. I did live in New York for a while. And then I, I moved back to New Hampshire and say, okay, I'm gonna put a business in New Hampshire because it's no business with the system that I have. I opened the barbershop in, in 2004. It was the first Spanish barbershop in New Hampshire. I started to do like Latino help and the way they call it Latino help, like everybody who doesn't know where to go, we put a border in the wall and that's started bringing us more business, more business. Para ser aceptado en la comunidad, lo primero fue un poco difícil porque nosotros los hispanos somos un poquito escandalosos. El sistema de aquí americano, en un negocio o en una calle, se ve más tranquilo y nosotros no somos de esa forma. Y ahí ya no traía problemas, pero ellos se fueron adaptando que nosotros veníamos a trabajar. Not too long ago, I had COVID vaccinations here at this barbershop. Yes. Why did you do that? I did that because a lot of Latinos probably they don't know to see the news in, in English, they don't know where to go, mm -hmm. what to do. And we communicate to them that you can come to us, and you can get vaccinated. Esta barbería significa mucho para la comunidad porque esta barbería principalmente fue la primera que llegó a Nashua. Y aparte de ser la primera que llegó, llegó la primera comunicación social. 
con el latino y el americano. Los comunicamos hacia un trabajo, hacia un apartamento. Todo el mundo llegaba y a veces se sentaba el día entero ahí a esperar qué podíamos nosotros ofrecerle. Y así mismo fuimos conectando, conectando y hoy en día todavía todas esas personas hablan de nosotros. Para mí ese es el sueño americano tú logras un objetivo en este país. I think we can all agree that New Hampshire and most of New England has never exactly been known as a bastion for multicultural communities. But rapidly emerging Latinx populations are changing that. In college towns like Boston, where diversity can sometimes feel transient, the international student population is leaving its mark. I'm from Miami, Florida. I go to school at MGH Institute of Health Professions. I'm originally from Buenos Aires, Argentina, and I study at Emerson College in Boston, Massachusetts. I am from Venezuela, but um, I used to live in Miami, and I go to Berkeley College of Music. I'm from Dominican Republic, and I go to Berkeley College of Music. <laughs> Depending on the area where you live in, there could be a lot of Latino businesses. Just recently, a Venezuelan place was open near MIT. We also get to see a lot of Latinos performing in Boston. It's definitely a much smaller community than I'm used to in Miami, but I do think it's getting better. Uh, there are a lot of Latinos who, who study here, and there's also a lot of Latinos who live here. I love hearing people speak Spanish. East Boston is like known to be the Hispanic community of Boston. In the beginning, I thought it was going to be very hard to find my own uh, food. I actually found it super quick. My school, for example, has this organization called Amigos. And Amigos is a organization that brings together the Latin American community at Emerson College. A lot of people find that uh, pretty fun going to Latino places because of our music, our culture. A lot of people I've met in Boston who are not part of the Latinx community are very into Bad Bunny. None. <laughs> I don't listen to Bad Bunny. A lot, actually. <laughs> Argentinian like coffee store where they have cakes and they're so good and they're very sweet and uh, they have a lot of like dulce de leche coffee there and the cake just hits different. I really miss that like warmth that I used to feel when I lived in Miami. I guess I just miss having the community that I had in Miami. Other than friends and family, I don't miss pretty much anything. Hundreds of billions of dollars in federal funds are allocated to communities based on census numbers. Funds used for critical social services, mental health programs, hospitals, public works, infrastructure like highway planning and the construction of roads, also schools, college costs, housing assistance, jobs programs. Oh, and did you get a STEMI this year or a CARES Act small business loan? Census data helps earmark those funds too. I guess what I'm really trying to say is, you're welcome. In the vast majority of U.S. counties, the Latinx community showed up in droves. We rolled deep. We turned the census party. We slayed the system. We showed up and showed... You get the idea. Emerging Latinx populations are making their mark across the country with no signs of slowing down. So, get into it. I'm Gabriela Fresquez for Radar 2021. Thanks for watching Radar 2021. Please like, subscribe, and comment down below and let us know what issues are important to you. Because let's be honest, there are a lot of issues to choose from. <laughs> so, so many.